Hello and welcome to this 10th video. I'm amazed that uh, there are 10 and I've been very pleased so far with the almost entirely positive reaction that you guys have made towards my work so thank you very much. Uh, this one's about War Machine and discussion of this term is found in the very long rather rambling Plateau 12 of a thousand plateaus ATP and the plateau is called Treatise on Nomadology, the War Machine. So, as we might predict from the title, the first discussions of the war machine in this plateau refer to the characteristics of nomads, who, among other things, construct war machines. Now, we've seen uh, nomads talked up a bit in the video on Smooth Space. The writing is typical Deleuze and Guattari, I'm afraid, with all sorts of offhand references to things like anthropological studies of the Bantu people of southern Africa, an epic poem by Kleist, or the development of technology according to somebody called Ser, that's uh, Ceres if you anglicised it, which is, as you might have gathered, unfortunately still in French, so I can't access it. The discussion is punctuated with various axioms, propositions and problems, but I must say I didn't find them very helpful. Perhaps you will. Overall, it's quite an exhausting read, and you will need to take it easy and stay tightly focused. For us, the topic here is the war machine rather than nomads and their fascinating practices. You can forgive yourself if you can't follow all the dazzling detours yet. You can come back to them in time. And that's what I did with Kleist's poem and thoroughly enjoyed it when I had time to read it. There's a more extensive set of notes on the whole plateau, Plateau 12, on my website. And again, I've put a reference to that file and everything else on a transcript, which uh, you can also find on that website. Luckily, there's a much more readable book by Delander, 1991, which uses some of the concepts in Deleuze and Guattari to explain war machines and what they are, mostly in a military context. Again, I have some notes on this book on my website. More generally, the term war machine is also quite frequently used in dialogues. That's Deleuze and Parnay, 1987, Deleuze and Parnet if we're going to anglicise things. I've got some notes on that. And this is about resisting the state and capitalism largely through the cultural politics of the 1960s. Incidentally, if you're remotely interested in the cultural politics of the 1960s, uh, they, the main themes are quite well described in Chapter 4 of Dialogues. So, as usual, what we're going to try to do is to manage the labyrinth by pursuing some of the examples first and then getting to some possible underlying principles. You might find it useful to have looked at the work on smooth space first, since many of the characteristics of smooth space can also be produced by nomads and eventually the war machines they produce. Nomads are flexible and creative, we're reminded in this one, because their interest is in moving as a matter of joining up points, not following conventional paths. They constantly challenge the forms of geographical and social organisation introduced by the state. So, you might be led to think that nomads are necessary for war machines to develop, except that in the very last section of this plateau we're told that this is not always so, that artists can also create war machines, although they have a more philosophical task to do. Basically, they have to construct smooth spaces by investigating abstract possibilities in various systematic ways. Naturally, that will involve Deleuzean terminology like the plane of consistency and the machinic phylum we're going to talk about the machinic phylum a bit lower down and uh, it, we're going to stick with the Latin form of the plural in this case like Deleuze and Guattari do and refer to machinic phyla in the plural. Okay, let's start with some examples of war machines and uh, these are pretty variable. The game of chess, for example, is compared to the game of Go. 
not very helpful if you don't play both like me but there's quite a lot of detail so you can get the basics. There's some anthropological stuff about warriors and their historical detachment from social order and the state. So the German tribes once defeated the Roman legions because they had very flexible organisation, for example. This is where we find reference to Kleist's poem, Penthesilea, and that portrays the great warrior Achilles as a dangerously undisciplined, unpredictable and volatile person, not at all happy to accept the orders of the Greek kings and fit into their army. This is just like Homer says in the Iliad, and just like the way Brad Pitt plays Achilles in the film Troy. In the poem, incidentally, Penthesilea is queen of the Amazons who meets Achilles on the battlefields around Troy. She's supposed to be engaged in capturing a normal warrior and taking him home to breed new little Amazons. But instead she falls in love with Achilles and as a result abandons the culture and the strict social and military rules of the Amazons. Let's get back to ATP. We find some general characteristics for the first time on page 392 and these are referred to as secrecy, speed and affect. These appear to guide the discussion rather sporadically in what follows. Moving in smooth space is explicitly suggested early on as a characteristic as well. Well we're going to discuss those criteria in a minute. Let's consider some other examples first. There's an important difference between so-called royal science, I think this is actually found in Foucault. Royal science is state-sponsored and institutionally established. And on the other hand, there's nomadic science. Nomads here are those creative free thinkers in mathematics, science and engineering who were always a bit marginal to officially recognized science and engineering. They were outsiders although very creative ones at first anyway. The obvious example, not actually mentioned in the text, would be, I suppose, the young Einstein working at the Swiss patent office before doing his famous work on relativity. There have been creative military thinkers too, and Delanda quite likes Napoleon Bonaparte, a classic outsider, not even born in proper France, who developed the first People's Army and also worked out ways to involve the people in military campaigns, as well as thinking up some pretty novel tactics, which were very successful at first. There are also heroic philosophers as private thinkers, those not employed in state institutions, and the obvious example mentioned here is Nietzsche, who once argued that we should take a hammer to the official icons of philosophy. I think that's in Twilight of the Idols. He wrote in a way that was quite unlike official philosophical work, and the unorthodox forms here include reference to mythical characters like Zarathustra, metaphors of various kinds, homely aphorisms, and folkish songs. I must say I don't respond terribly well to those. Nietzsche is also a good example to remind us that even the most nomadic private thinker can eventually be incorporated into state apparatuses. So Nietzsche notoriously became a Nazi hero. Uh, what might be worse, he became uh, another philosopher on the syllabus of middling English universities, a model for others to follow. It's not just philosophers. We're told that early stonemasons also saw the task of shaping stone to build cathedrals as a kind of craft, and they used an informal kind of working geometry rather than fully mathematical one. The mathematical designs came later as a result of professional architects wanting to impose their will on the stone. I'm reminded here that my favourite novel, Moby Dick, also says that whale hunters divided up whale corpses using their own geometrical forms. I think uh, they had a measure, uh, rather a shape, called a quorn. In ACP we also find praise for early metal workers and metallurgists who are often nomads, or at least itinerants, 
and they learn to work metal as a form of art at first, noting the important qualitative changes in the material as they worked it, responding to the properties in the metal as well as to their own intentions imposed from outside. In particular, nomadic metal workers were alert to the possibilities in these things I've mentioned called machinic phyla. Now, I think there's a very good explanation of what these are in DeLander's book on war machines. We normally think of a machine as an actual device to do work, a washing machine or a motorbike. But there's an abstract definition too. In abstract terms, a machine is a form of productive organisation of forces, sometimes expressed very abstractly as an equation or a formula. The term can also sometimes be applied to social or linguistic structures as well. A phylum generally is a group of objects, or in this case machines, that have a similar basic structure. It's also possible to think in terms of a development, a phylogenetic development, between machines with a similar structure, perhaps an evolutionary one, developing more and more sophisticated possibilities. Delanda gives the example of propulsive weapons that use the same basic notions of propulsive force and ways to constrain it in a cylinder, which provides a linear direction for the force. Once you have the basic idea, once you can draw a diagram of the forces in Deleuzean terms, you can pick up on any new inventions and move from blowpipes to gunpowder and cannons and eventually guided missiles. Steam engines are another byproduct of understanding propulsive forces and cylinders. It's an important part of the development of human capacity to realise the existence of machinic phyla of all kinds and try to access them, draw abstract diagrams of the dimensions that are possible. Well, the argument is that early metal workers were particularly good at recognising these possibilities as they pursued various combinations of heat, chemical composition, force, working techniques and so on. There's an implication for the use of numbers, which I think we've mentioned in the video on smooth space. Nomadic organisations use numbers to do useful things like counting, so as to estimate the forces and sizes of warrior bands and the opposition, say. But they didn't develop the abstract capacity of numbers to subdivide, classify, striate and specialise as modern armies or states do. Nomads probably knew how to do this, but possibly chose not to, since that would bring about stifling top-down organisational forms. The original use of numbers in this way was crucial to the later developments, however, so that nomads more or less invented the social use of numbers. Right at the end of the plateau we get some political examples and I think these have probably been quite influential all along. The first mention of War Machine I came across, for example, was in Guattari's book Psychoanalysis and Transversality, that's Guattari 1972, I have some notes on him. And he is discussing the sort of organisation that socialist militants ought to develop. The trick was to try to organise effectively to take on capitalism without getting too stratified and rigid. The French Communist Party was very effectively organised at the time but was Stalinist. Uh, Trotskyite groups were more flexible but they were becoming sectarian and defensive. Maoists were good at organising too but they were far too keen on the uncritical cult of personality of Chairman Mao. All these options were around in the 1960s and Guattari debates the pros and cons about most of them. Guattari also formed or joined all sorts of other political groups too, militant groups. And he eventually came to argue that we had to open channels of proper communication with other groups as well as militants. This is transversal communication. We had to both talk to and listen to students or normal workers as well as militants. 
And the way he describes this is requiring an effective but flexible and open war machine. The other example was provided by the modern guerrilla forces that were proving to be militarily pretty successful in China, Cuba and of course Vietnam. Guerrilla warfare or people's war had caused a great deal of rethinking in theoretical circles too since it seemed to offer a new way to break capitalist states without adopting their usual methods of Bolshevik revolution or winning power through the ballot box. Guerrilla forces are obviously loosely organised, flexible in their choices of weapons and locations, able to flow through territories rather than having to occupy particular specialist territories, or for that matter, having to develop specialised positions like ranks in an army. We mentioned this a bit in the video on the rhizome. The tactics and the theoretical implications for the French Communist Party of the successful guerrilla war in Cuba are actually well described in an influential book by Debray, if you're interested, and I've put a reference to that in the transcript. Deleuze and Guattari warn us, however, that guerrilla warfare is often combined in practice with more orthodox warfare. This happens classically in the final stages of the campaign. The most sustained discussion of the political aspects of war machines is found in dialogues, though. This was written before A Thousand Plateau, and it tries out some of the points met already. It is probably more readable. It doesn't bang on about nomads so much. So we are told that the war machine originates in a different way from the state. It was originally developed by nomadic people against sedentary people. It features a focus on problems, not fixed theorems. The state itself persists through the exercise of binary machines and overcodings of space and social life. But the war machine is run through with various kinds of becomings. These include the becomings imperceptible of the warrior. Page 141. The war machine follows lines of flight and deterritorialization. This is compatible with its strategy when it turns to military action. The example is the nomad army of Genghis Khan. Incidentally, the date which appears in the title of Plateau 12 is 1227, and this is the date Genghis Khan died. Dialogues is not advocating immediate military action, though. It is more optimistic about resisting states with war machines in cultural politics. States actually have a problem of integrating the war machine and institutionalising it. So there is a way, a residual tension between the two. Even the most centralised state is not at all the master of its plans. It is also an experimenter. Pages 145 to 146. The state must adapt to change. So there is room for local and opportunistic forms of resistance. The question for resistors doing oppositional politics is organisational, not ideological. That is, we should not wait until we develop a full political programme. Instead, we can ask some questions. Can we think of an organisation which does not mirror state apparatuses? Can we assess assemblages in terms of how close they are to the state apparatus? Can we develop a suitable modern war machine which will avoid becoming fascist and not divert its own powers of destruction? Perhaps we could try out these thoughts on universities. In the radical 60s it all seemed more likely. I quote, in a certain way it is very simple. This happens on its own and every day. Page 145. There is no need to organise a revolutionary apparatus on the scale of the state. Mm, those were happy optimistic days. Back to ATP. We find more caution in the later work. 
as usual, examples in each case are likely to be mixed. We're told there's going to be a constant struggle between war machines and states, for example. Royal science is always looking to build on the achievements of nomadic science. Craftsmen are always likely to be incorporated into more regular structured occupations. Nomad mathematics is always likely to be systematised. Warriors and their fighting groups are always likely to be incorporated into state armies. As usual then, we need to pin down some pure definitions if we can, because after all, we are philosophers. Maybe in the glorious 60s it was less important to philosophise, but now we have to. And we flirted with this idea a bit earlier when discussing the notions of secrecy, speed and affect. These actually are not developed very systematically, especially the notion of secrecy, which seems to imply being able to operate outside the state organisations and outside their systems of surveillance, to be private. Affect is a bit more interesting, taking the term to mean human reactions, emotions in the most general sense. It's obvious that actual wars release all sorts of powerful affects as state organisations break down. People lose their normal sense of being a responsible citizen and normal human being. They become desubjectified, as Deleuze and Guattari put it. These affects can be so powerful as to produce creative and unusual effects including various kinds of becoming. Well, we can understand in a quite straightforward way that warriors might become animal, but what they mean is they not only become brutal, but cunning, resourceful and adaptable. Warriors can also show becoming woman, which seems a bit unlikely on the face of it, but there are some cases cited, I think better cited in the plateau on becoming and referenced in dialogues as well, where warriors disguise themselves as women, not only to hide from the enemy, but to adapt and to learn from the activity how to live a normal life. Speed refers to that rather special usage that crops up quite a lot in ATP and elsewhere in Deleuzean work. High or infinite speed really refers to a capacity to make connections instantly and that happens best in smooth space. It's that capacity that explains qualitative difference and deviations from the normal. The state is constantly attempting to regulate these high speed connections to slow things down and this is one reason why the state always attempts to striate space and to impose other forms of regularity and to generalise. High speed connections are associated with singularity, flow and deterritorialization. Of course, actual active organisations, including war machines, operate with variable speeds. Perhaps the most common example here is the counter-attack where patient slow defence suddenly turns into surprisingly rapid attack. Anyway, we have some general characteristics here which might possibly help us distinguish the pure war machine. It's the same sort of exercise that we saw trying to develop the pure smooth space. What we shall end with is an abstract or ideal war machine. Now here, uh, as you've already noticed, we don't need to focus exclusively on military activity or even militant politics. We've seen this with some examples like science and metalworking. The ideal war machine can also describe innovative practice in the arts, in painting, in politics and in philosophy. It will feature a set of activities that closely parallel those found in the invention of smooth space. What you have to do, we suggested in that video, is take a plane, cut through a multiplicity, and then explore how it actually connects with everything else. As usual, this plateau ends with a warning that, like smooth space, war machines are very attractive to capitalist states as well, because they're so innovative and flexible. In the video on smooth space, we saw that the smooth, unregulated dimensions of the sea 
also proved to be ideal for the development of the modern free-roaming undetectable nuclear submarine. Current notions of total war also show how a state can harness the flexibility and the dangerous affects of war machines to develop a war without limits.